In Kenya, one in five girls have already had a baby or are pregnant. Between July of 2016 and June 2017, 378,400 girls became pregnant. This age bracket of 10 to 19 years represents 24% of Kenya's population. Early sexual debut, unplanned pregnancy, higher number of births, these remain issues for adolescent girls and young women. And that is our focus on Health Digest, where we delve into these issues with the audience made up of youth represented from various parts of Kenya. We are at AMREF Health Africa in conjunction also with SRH Alliance to delve into these pertinent issues. I'm your host, Dr. Masi Korir. And to start off this discussion is a short clip on teenage pregnancies by Mary Mwoki. <laughs> The Kenya Demographic Health Survey 2014 indicates that 13,000 teenage girls drop out of school every year due to pregnancy. Deep in the heart of the sprawling slums of Kibera, right here in Nairobi City. Terin Duta welcomes us into this makeshift house. Duta dropped from school after she got pregnant while in Form 2. The father of her unborn child disowned her and she resorted to procuring an abortion. I got a ball. 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 A stone's throw from Duta's house, we meet Marcy Atieno, who is now 23 years old. Atieno painfully narrates the many abortions she's carried out before she finally had the baby she is holding in her arms. She takes a painful trip down memory lane. She was a teenager, barely out of form for when she found herself pregnant, albeit unintentionally. <laughs> Listening to their stories, one gets a deep sense of despondency among the teenagers and a deeply seated belief among these victims of circumstances that abortion is the only way out of an unplanned pregnancy. Sadly, the consequences can be fatal and the risks too high for them. We get us from 17 and above. And sometimes you even get 15 years. You have some kind of backstreet clinics which have different kind of modalities in terms of how they do the abortions. So from the kind of experience we get from the young girls, the way they explain themselves, the, some of them they are given some pills, some of them they are done some procedures, which are called the manual kind of vacuum aspiration. The issue of teenage pregnancies and unsafe abortion is like a ticking bomb that stakeholders agree needs to be addressed urgently with questions arising as to whether poverty really plays a role in early pregnancies and remedies for the situation. Data from the Ministry of Health indicates that unsafe abortions are a leading cause in maternal deaths due to the inherent complications. Mary Mwoki, KTN News for Health Digest. That story on teenage pregnancy sets the tone for this discussion, and not just teenage pregnancies, but also HIV, because we know that 50% of new infections in Kenya are among the youth. And to have this discussion, I have a panel of three. To my immediate right is Lucy Mambise, who is a youth advocate at Family Health Options Kenya, FHOK. We have uh, Victor Karioki, who is an advocate at Saudi Skika, uh, and also Kenya Ethical and Legal Network, that's Kellen. Last but not least is uh, Damaris Oyando, who's a program manager at Women Fighting AIDS in Kenya, that is WOFAC. And just to start this particular conversation, I think I'd like to start with you, uh, Damaris. The issue of teenage pregnancies, what do you have to say about it? Um. First and foremost, when you come to the slum areas, this is the most uh, area affected with teenage pregnancies. Why? Because of uh, 
poverty within that area. There's a lot of transactional sex going on, with especially the young girls between ages 15 to 24. So it's something that we need to wake up and uh, act on it right now. Otherwise, it's overtaking the good work that uh, I would say CSOs and uh, the health organizations are doing. Yeah. I love to agree with what my sister has said and also add on uh, maybe uh, peer pressure per se because uh, in where I work I also volunteer at a facility in Madare called uh, HF Kenya or Blue House where as it, in that youth group if you don't have a child you're considered as in uncool as in to, to them, because like one, one of the kids came and asked me, Victor, uh, since my cousin, as in you're older than us, why haven't we seen any child from you? As in, who are you? I was like, okay, I'm fast, I'm not ready. Yeah, well, there are a lot of factors that narrow down to this. Uh, lack of awareness is also one of it in the informal settlements so they lack the information of contraceptives modern contraceptive methods so it becomes a factor uh, as i will agree with both my colleagues here peer pressure the environment the poverty transactional sex and also the lack of sexual information let's let's hear a story from one of a teenage, one teenage mom this is a shikomwangi who eight years ago at the age of 17 became a teen mom. Let's hear her story. Uh, eight years ago I was a teenager and I was in secondary school just like a normal kid. I used to play, I, I was in girls school and used to play like any other girl. And uh, mostly, uh, you know, from people from, we, we tend to think people from the slums knows everything. So I used to go to jam session and everything, but usually I used to go home. And later on, I didn't go for any other, maybe all these that we are doing like right now, like any empowerment on young girls. So my first time having sex is when I got pregnant. So, and I didn't know it was pregnancy. And until I was four months preg five to four months pregnant, so I, I, I just felt my belly getting bigger and my you, know, you see like I, I used to say oh I, I, when I finished high school sorry I weighed like that four kg, now I was becoming bigger and I thought kumbe mta ki maliza seko hu grow. Now now it uh, I was I was becoming hippie and the same time my belly was getting bigger so. Sikwana relate, and now something was playing in my stomach. So, first of all, I dewormed, and then later on, the only corner, I, Iminyo, and then I had people saying I was pregnant. Um, then, uh, when in the slum, it's, 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 it's very easy to catch up. You just catch up and then it you can kill him to no one, any corner ball, any poor at least to the Okyom Dogo, and then Utale Araka. So, and that's the norm. We have normalized it that way. And that's how I got my first baby uh, eight years ago. So, with all that, when I went first to the clinic, to the public clinic, I was, to, the first time I went to the clinic, you see, uh, my belly didn't get that bigger. So, sweater. So I, I went to a public facility and told them, I have come for an ANC. Um, it's, a, it's a public around my area. And then they were like, let's go to Pata Mimba Utakuja because they didn't see the belly. And now I had, I didn't even get the immunization until I was eight months, now I went to a private facility. You see like now being a teenage mom, and later on uh, the government was giving out the vouchers, the, uh, the birth vouchers, uh, they were called Jamibora. You were paying 300. I had to save for the 300, so do like how many months, even I had to borrow to get the 300 and get 200 was for uh, the voucher and 100 was the for the family planning. So, but the for family planning, I sold it out because I didn't have a family yet. Because I didn't feel she, he was my son and not my family because I have a family. So I sold it out for 100 bob after I had given birth. Uh, and, that's, and that was it, that's how I became a mom. But it was easier for me to, tra to transit again to being a mom because my mom was there. But now at this end, I'm off high school. I've never worked anywhere else. I have this kid. 
I was used to books and playing, and that's it. And now I have to milk this baby, and I need money on the table. So I used to go now to, to work. And now with my small body, I didn't get any work at any professional job. So I used to maybe go to the hotels and do work, and then come back with a hundred bob on the way. Because I was still a, a teenager, I used to eat that cash. I didn't have a home na 40 bob or something. So still. And then I got into a youth group. I stayed there for one month, and they gave me a hundred bob. And I saw it as a glory. You see, I was still a child having a child at home. So you see, with, uh, from where I come from, that's one of the challenges that we have. We have normalized this issue of teenage pregnancy and teenagers having babies. Because even now we have formed a young mother's group that you find people are saying, oh, at next, next year, nitakwa ni mamaliza shule, nitaingeo group yenyu. And I believe me, you, next year she will be in our group because she will be a teenage mom. We are trying to go to school and educate young girls about teenage pregnancy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shiko, for that. And I think she's raised really uh, pertinent issues. And for me, what stands out is the uh, knowledge gap where it's like information is not there. Like she thought she, she was having worms and she was deworming. So yeah. where I thought it, we are in an era where information is all out here. Yet, there's no information out there to the girls. I don't know. Damaris. Um, that is true, especially for young girls in the slum areas and those in school. So if we don't manage giving information, especially sexual, sexual information, which is more age appropriate in schools, this is the problem we face. Because remember, we need to target young people in school and out of school. We have girls and boys who are out of school, but they feel they are mature enough to engage in sex. So when you talk about getting, getting sexually active early, these are some of the issues that come forward. So it's true, without information, girls are prone to getting pregnant early. And even if you look at one of the drivers for the girls getting pregnant, like the border border riders, they're very young boys and they have money. So the young girls are lured to the border border riders because they can be able to provide for them at that particular time, not knowing the consequences behind it. So for me, I still prefer that uh, sexual education should still go on both in school and out of school, but we make it age appropriate. So that as the, as the young people mature, then they get to know how do I react how do I communicate with the opposite sex? How do I carry myself out with the opposite sex? And especially issues around life skills. It's very important. When I was young, I would be taught how to, you know, how to manage myself, how to walk, how to communicate with the opposite sex. But I think right now there's a gap which uh, both teachers, parents, and even the students should actually step in and see how best we can keep our girls in school without getting pregnant. I, I can say as parents, uh, they have failed or we have failed, not a parent yet. But uh, we need to have as in discussions with our children, either before dinner or after dinner, as in talk to your child, talk to your boy, talk to your girl, as in let them know what, okay, yes, what sex is and safe sex is. As I agree with the Victor here, sex should be talked about to our children at, at home because parents are the ones who we trust as, as children, as young people. So talking about sex at home, it starts at home and then it will be okay and we'll be informed on what decisions to make after out there. Yeah. Okay. There's a gap of information and as human beings we try to fill the gap as much as we can. As a child, if you don't get your information from the adults or from the teachers, or you've all been told that sex is bad, you ask your friend, what is this sex? What is it about pregnancy? And that's how they lie to each other. They tell each other that the first time having sex, you can't get pregnant. They tell you that if you have sex when standing up, you can't get pregnant. And you do those things unknowingly, thinking that I can't get AIDS the first time. People have very different ideas and when you don't give a channel of information for the right idea, there's so many other wrong ideas that are put into the picture. 
So I think it should start not only with the parents, but I think there should be a channel of information that's within the students themselves and the children themselves because they trust each other as much as they trust the people who are older than them. When communication is one-sided, uh, parents, teachers talk about the negative sides of sex and never educate about the, the, other, the positive sides of sex. Meaning that gap that is there, that's what she's talking about. Now you want to know. And who do you know? Who will you learn from? So you always go to your friend, uh, those border border guys, uh, Madame is talking about, and so that way misleading your ideas. And now you have the negative side that is legally well taught, but the positive not well taught. I think that's why we're missing the point. Okay, there was this girl I was mentoring back in my in my hood in Laksama. She's a form four lady, so. I always took my time to mentor people. So this girl was, was in Form 4. I was trying to mentor about maybe issues of sex, issues of adolescent. Like me, there was some time an uh, issue came. Aka nikujia kanyambia vaneli, minta kuenda bash. Nikamambia bash? Yeah, I want to go to bash ni jibambe. Eh? Nikamuliza, unta kujibamba, yes. No unajua, it's, it's only two weeks to your exam. Unafokali eh, Form 4. Na sayu unaongelea story ya bash. Are you, are you really serious with your life? Dema kaniambia ati. We ni nani unishow hizi story? Mamangu, mamangu aja niambia kitu. Eh, mzezo wangu aja ini kalisha chini ya niambia hizi story za sijui oo, oh, oh, sijui kuni kazi ya maisha. So who are you niambia? So I was like, this information is a sex, nini, hizi, hizi challenges my youth, wana, nini, my teenage wana pitia. Niza sema, my parents wetu ndi wapatia ni full information. As teachers, we only give uh, maybe 50 percent. Hizo zingine niwe mzazi ukaina mtoto wako mfunzi about adolescence. Uh, when it comes to sex education, uh, where the gap is, still we have a big issue in the society. When I talk about the society, I'm talking about the religious leaders. When Before when I went to church, uh, my religious leader never used to talk to us about sex. When you talk about sex, our parents and our, lead, our religious leaders would tell us that that is bad manners, without telling us the, what bad manners is. So when we grew up, we knew that sex was bad manners only when we are in church or only when we are at home. We didn't know that bad manners, it's also bad manners when we are out there. So we ended up having sex, knowing that sex is only bad manners in church and at home. So lack of information also from our parents. Our parents doesn't want to talk about condoms. When you talk about condom, before when I, when I started talking about condom at home, my grandmother told me that it's either I stop talking about that or I go away and never come back again. I, I sat down with her and she was like, oh no, that is bad manners. I went ahead to talk to my friend who told me that, yes, your grandmother is old, she doesn't know what, what a condom is. So I went out to get information from my peers where my peers also misled me. So lack of information is also a big issue in our society. I'm a, I am a health advocate, a young health advocate from RHNK, and I think I'm a living testimony of CEC because I was never taught in school, but trust me, one session saved me. One session on condom use saved me because in, during my first sex, sexual intercourse, I was confident enough to, 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 to talk about condom. So I think this is something we need to introduce. I knew nothing about sex. I knew, I knew nothing totally. Any, any person who is raised in slum, trust me, people think that we know a lot about sex, but we know nothing about sex. So I think if we, if we, if we embrace this, if we push for this agenda, even for the parents themselves, my mother herself, the first, the first, the first um, job I got was for distributing contraceptive. And trust me, I was not confident enough to do this, but my mom could help me on that. And it's because she, I, 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 I told her that I understand the importance of this, and she helped me out. So I think there's information gap, and we, 
let's not blame our parents. It's just that they don't know how to do it. And the how really matters. Two sets of people have been adversely mentioned, if I may say that, that parents don't give this information or don't know how to give this information. And then also now just the role of religion and religious leaders where any sex education or sex talk is, is demonized. I don't know from your experiences, are these everyday issues and how are you overcoming this? I come from Isili. Isili is um, most populated with the Muslim. So we do outreaches as an organization. And during these outreaches, we get a lot of opposition from the community leaders who are Muslim. And they say it's a taboo talking about contraceptives to their, to their young girls. So it's, it, it has become a barrier talking about contraceptives and family planning to young, girls, young Muslim girls in my community. I don't want to, com to comment about uh, religion, but I'll say about parents not, probably not knowing uh, how to pass, the, to pass the information. But sometimes they try, but they do give the wrong information. Like for instance, when a child, a young girl asks the mom, uh, what's this? Instead of the mom telling the girl that this is called a vagina, uh, they tell her that this is called a cookie. If we just, we start, I mean the moms start, or the moms or the parents, both parents start talking about the names, not calling them some other funny, funny names. They should but, say it as it is. Yes, at, as it is, but at the right age, not starting at in one year old. We understand we are bad the diapers. Yeah. Okay. Damaris. Um, yes. I think for parents, it's a, it's a challenge. And uh, some parents choose what information to share in terms of sexuality with their children. And uh, I think that is where parents fail, because information that you give your child is trusted to that child. And for me, it is true, you need to walk them through issues around sexuality. And as young as, I'll tell you, as young as class four, children will come and ask you, what is sex? So as a parent, you should know how to package this information to give, to give your child. You may not give them so much because they're still very young, but give them information that you feel they can handle at that age. You can tell them, yes, sex, is a, is a union, you know, it's meant for people who are united at that particular age. And let this child know that she's supposed to protect, um, you know, her, I, would, I would say her vagina or her penis, let no one touch it. It's supposed to be private, you know, you shouldn't go showing around to people because we also have abuse cases and you find a child who is playing, a two-year-old, a three-year-old playing and someone passing by and just the look of this is the private part of this girl, they get aroused by it. So for me, it is good to give information, but enough information for that child to be able to move to the next stage where they can get more information about what they ask. And when you go to churches, um, I would say it's mixed, but I feel that churches should have youth meetings especially for young people in the churches, have them together and talk to them on issues around sexuality. It may not be that deep, but let also the church be involved because this is something affecting the whole community. Not only the parents, but even the young people in churches need to hear that the religious leaders, the people they trust, the people who are supposed to build their faith, also care for them and are able to give them information around sex. There is usually negative peer pressure, a lot of negative peer pressure among adolescents and youth. Uh, yes, I've learned that girls are also influencing each other to get babies early, as our sister has shared with us. There are those who are saying they'll join the charmer for the young women with, with babies. Eh? What I've learned that's new to me today is that boys are also influencing each other, or young men, as we have been told by one of the panelists, that uh, uh, what's happening? Uh, do you have anything? And they are taking pride in sharing about their children. So I've realized there's also still low awareness about sex and its consequences among adolescents and youth. Um, parents are responsible. The church is responsible. There's also the schools, and there's also the health system. Yeah. So as a healthcare worker, what I'll say is we've made some efforts at the health facilities to have youth 
peer navigators at the health facilities to support ad adolescents and young people when they come to the health facilities. As our sister here told us, she went to the clinic and she didn't know where to start and they could not believe that she's pregnant. So we are trying to have um, youth desks or youth rooms where a youth can just step in there and talk about the service they have so that they can be able to be supported to even navigate through the health system and through the facility. Because even myself, when I remember as an adolescent, it was, it was very hard for me to go on my own to the hospital. I wonder where will I start? Everybody is looking at me as an adolescent and youth, you're shy to ask or to even state what took you there. So those are the th some of the things we are doing. We'll take a very short break on that. And when we'll come back, I want us to really discuss uh, what she's raised. And this is the role of online and social media platforms on fueling this particular problem and definitely the consequences of uh, teenage pregnancies. So we'll take a short break and uh, let's look at this week's myth or fact. HIV is a disease of the older persons. Myth. Although the number of new HIV infections among young people has been declining, they still remain at most risk of the virus. An estimated 185,000 young adults in Kenya were living with HIV in 2017. Homa Bay, Kisumu, Siaya, Migori and Nairobi counties had at least 1,000 young people newly infected with HIV in the same year. 